Welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Well, as much as it drives Fuzzy Butts all over this world, absolutely crazy when they hear me say it. I am the host of this show, your big dog, Luke Robinson, and we're happy to have back again with us this week our co-pilot, co-host. She's almost always here all the time, Ginger Morgan. She's the executive director of the Puppy Up Foundation. Ginger, how are you? I'm doing well, Luke. How are you? Good, good. It's Nobody ever well. asks you how you are. <laughs> you never do. That's a, a salient point, actually. Uh, what well, nobody does. Nobody asks me. Uh, that that's that that's part of the job being a host of the show. I think. Uh, well, spring is almost here. Or at least it's warming up a little bit. So I'm, I'm I'm excited for that. We get to spend more time outside with the fuzzy butts. Um, but uh, today's guest, I'm really excited about um, because it's very recent and very relevant to both you and me. But I'll save that scary story for later and just introduce our guest. Uh, it's Dr. Renee Schmidt. She's with the Pet Poison Helpline. Dr. Schmidt, how are you? Hello. Welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. This is a great topic. I'm very excited. And we have a rather lengthy uh, list of talking points. I, I hope that didn't scare you off, but it's such an interesting and exciting mm. topic. And in reading your CV... Uh, uh, you have done a ton of research uh, on some very interesting, relevant uh, new new topics for pet parents. And, and I think this is going to be one of our most well listened to, most frequently listened to shows, because uh, I looked at this and I'm like, wow, this, this is just these are things that I want to learn more about. So um, not to take up too much time with this show on me, because my fears were going to run lo wrong, run, it, run long. And if we do. We might just we might just invite you back for for a part two to follow up on some of these you bet, things. You bet. Um, so I do the, want to mention, Luke, that March is Poison Prevention Awareness Month. Got to get that out there. Yep, <laughs> yep, you got it. Well, that's just around the corner. I'm not sure if we're gonna if we're gonna air that. Maybe we should air that the first uh, week of March in honor of that, uh, because these. Huh. Were, yeah, that because might have been... you had that in mind. That's why I, I don't also, I, I, I feel, I guess, and I'd like to mention, Ginger, you're also kind of my co-producer too, not just a co-host because you do the scheduling and the booking of our guests. And that's something I should give you uh, uh, credit and uh, credit and thanks for from time to time. My bad. Oh, wow. You're welcome. I'll take that as a, <laughs> as a, uh, a thank you for that. <laughs> you, you won't be getting a uh, raise in pay though. That's, that's for sure. All right. Enough it sounds about like you. she may be the, the wizard behind the curtain, right? <laughs> You know, you have that exactly <laughs> right. You have no idea. <laughs> I was going to say most people mistakenly believe that, but 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 for 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 face value, let's just agree with that and move on. All right, enough about Ginger and, and me. Um, I'm excited to get to your story, and that's how we like to start this show. Uh, Renee is 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 your fuzzy butts, and then your origin story. So, do you have any fuzzy butts? I do. Yes, I have. I have, I have one dog, I have two cats. Um, if we're adding all the fuzzies, I have a horse and some gerbils, um, not quite as fuzzy, but more feathered. We have some chickens and some ducks and we just have a little bit of everything. Wow, it sounds like you've got a, got a family there. Lots yeah. Of, lots of fuzzy buds. Well, how did you get your start into veterinary medicine, first of all, and then with specializing in toxicology? Yeah, you bet. So I'd always had kind of a love of animals. If there was a stray dog, I would often set some food out um, so that my mother didn't see that, but set some food out. And for some reason, we had that stray dog for weeks at a time, usually hanging around our house. And it wasn't until I was in junior high, I had a Basset Hound dog who right before she turned two developed lymphoma. And uh, not to date my age, but at the time, the, the uh, treatment options were to put her on steroids or to send her up to a university where they would do kind of some research on different drugs with her. And so it was really at that time when I decided I'm going to be a veterinarian. I'm going to help these animals and I'm going to do what I can to, to try and save their lives. And I, so I was in eighth grade when I started that kind of decision and there was never any plan B for me. There was never any, well, maybe I shouldn't be, maybe I, you know, should come up with something different. 
that's just what I was going to, what I was going to do. And it's what I did. And then um, after graduation veterinary school, I was uh, in general practice and small animal general practice. I was in emergency work. Um, I worked with anesthesia and anesthesia for a while and just a lot of different um, kind of different avenues uh, throughout my profession. And then about 10 years ago, I started looking for something that I could do remotely because we lived in a more rural location and why I have so many different animals because we're not in an urban setting. And uh, so I kind of fell into it, to be honest. I, I thought, wow, this is, there was an opening and I thought this was, this was for me. It sounded really exciting and interesting. And so I was fortunate enough to, to have them hire me. And 10 years later, I've just, uh, I've loved it. And I've been able to become boarded, uh, a boarded uh, certified veterinarian in toxicology and in veterinary toxicology and just had a lot of different opportunities to, as you said, you know, just learn about different, di uh, different ways that, uh, that we can help animals through toxicology. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't go into cancer since your 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 heart yeah. dog, your first heart dog uh, that imprinted on you. It sounds like uh, got got cancer, but 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 it is interesting that and I fascinated. My dad was a doctor in Iowa, and I've known a lot of doctors and and white coat uh, people in my life, and I always find it fascinating how everyone they just take to uh, a subject matter, and that's that's their passion. So you have a wonderful origin story. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, that's a great story. Thank well, you. well, tell us about the Pet Poison uh, Helpline because that's a tremendous resource for pet parents and really kind of the foundation and underlying tones for the for the conversation today. Tell us how you got involved with them. Yeah, you bet. So, Pet Poison Helpline, we're a twenty four seven animal poison control center, and a lot of people haven't even heard of animal poison control centers being out there and. We're all familiar with that 1-800 number when our children get into something or we get into something and, and staffed by a human side with human nursing. And uh, we're that equivalent for animals. And so we are able to work with any species of pets or any species of animal. And if they a pet owner can call and talk with us about what it is that their animal got into or a veterinary clinic can call us directly and uh, we can help them as well. I would say the most common kind of route that happens is that the pet owner either is instructed to call us by their veterinarian or they have heard of us or they find us online and they call us and we decide if this is going to be a risk for concern for toxicity or not. If it is, is it something that can be treated at home, which unfortunately the reality is there's not much that we can do at home for these pets when they've been poisoned. Um, or if they need to go into the veterinarian. And then if they need to go into the veterinarian, the veterinary clinic calls us and then they talk with someone like me and we talk with them about what needs to be done. So what treatments are necessary, what clinical signs might be seen, when they could start, how long it could last, all of those things that are necessary to really ensure the, the proper, most appropriate treatment for the pet. And we follow that patient then out. So they can call us back as often as needed. It isn't just a one call and it's over. They can call us, the clinic can call us back as often as needed. That animal isn't responding the way it should. More signs have developed. Some, some different abnormalities are there. They can keep calling us back and we'll keep helping them with that ultimate goal of getting that animal back at home with their family. You know, it's been a while since I called the the the, the uh, pet poison uh, helpline. I'm not sure if that's the one I called. It may have been the the, the ASPCA has a separate uh, hotline. Is that is that accurate? Correct. Yep. There's two of us. Okay, and I can't remember which one it was, so I don't want to. Uh, I'm. I just want to make that clear. But I recall uh, calling them, and they said, "Well, we just don't give advice over the phone." Uh, because we can't there, we're not there, and we can't do all the diagnostics on on on. I can't remember which one of my fuzzy butt knuckleheads got into trouble. Uh, may not even been mine. Um, and uh, and they said the only way they would do it was 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 by paying with a credit card or giving a credit card. And I'm I'm assuming, and I understand again, growing up in the white smock industry, the malpractice, uh, legal issues surrounding that, and so on and so forth. But how does it work now for the pet parent when they're in that? really crisis situation. How does that work now? Yeah, you ask a great question. So we are a fee-based service. Uh, both of the animal, con uh, animal poison control centers are fee-based service. 
So we don't receive government funding in the manner that the human um, equivalent does. And so we do have to charge for our services. We have to, in order to keep our operations going, we have to charge for our services. And the um, on the veterinary side, the veterinary laws, they have what's called a veterinary client patient relationship um, this requirement. Every state has them. It depends a little bit state by state as to what specifics are within that. But that does keep us from being able to fully diagnose, um, give a lot of treatments, guidance, and things like that, especially for pet owners over the phone because we haven't physically seen that particular animal. Um, because we're a poison control center and we're dealing with emergency type situations, we are able to guide the veterinarian and the veterinary clinic so they can tell us. They are our eyes to say, this is what's going on, this is what's happening, and then we consult with them we offer them guidance as far as what is potentially going to happen and what needs to be done for their treatment. Yeah, I have no doubt that there's tremendous value for services, and I didn't mean to present it that way at all. Oh, no, not at all. Um, be because when you're in that crisis moment, that's precisely what you want. To, what you want is you want to talk to the experts um, that know it. And, 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 and fortunately, in some of the rural areas where you have country vets, um, well, actually, some of the country vets know some of the probably some of the the, the more obscure stranger to uh, toxins and to um, poisons that are out there. But 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 it's it's great to have access to that uh, database of knowledge that 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 the uh, pet poison helpline has to offer. My, here's another question. I just thought about it listening to you. Do you have a really good like FAQ section on your website that if the person can't afford it or something, or it's a very simple one, let, let's say like poinsettias, and they're just in that crisis mode that you can say, hey, go go here. This is the place, this is the resource um, that you need to find the answer you're looking for. Do you have that? Yes, absolutely. So our website is petpoisonhelpline.com. And we do have a tab that's called poison list. And we have hundreds, probably thousands of different types of products, plants, foods, chemicals, toxins, uh, that are in there and we talk about we give a brief description and what the concern is if it's something that's serious not really serious like you said poinsettias we would guide people to just stay home and watch their pet if they vomited numerous times and to take them in for for medication but we have that uh, def that resource available and you're right it's you know sometimes people either you know, they're not comfortable paying the fee they, they're not able to pay the fee for one reason or another, or they just want to do some more research on their own. Um, Dr. Google is always a blessing and a curse because we can't control what's real on uh, when we Google things. And so our website allows a reliable source of information for pet owners. Yeah, you, you type in any type of canine cancer research on Google and you're going to get all the ads up on top that populate yeah. the, top of the screen that are selling some type of, you know, cure, quote unquote, in, in bunny ears um, that that's a, some type of, you know, booster or something like this that has no no scientific research uh, behind it. So, well, well, Dr. Google, I like that term. I've, I've never heard that before. Well, let's let's skip around here. I, I I have some sort of structure to my my notes, but but since we're talking about it, let's go ahead and give the uh, audience, uh, uh, Dr. Schmidt, the the top really the top poisons, the big ones to to worry about and and always be concerned about that are in your household, surrounding your household, in kind of the everyday life of your fuzzy bud. Yeah, you bet. So when we, every year we pull up the top 10 toxins, the top 10 toxins overall, and then the top 10 toxins for dogs and cats, just because they make up the majority of our calls. And every year chocolate is number one. And I don't know that chocolate will ever get replaced to be honest, because I don't know about you, but I love chocolate. And so we pretty much always have it around in our household. It smells great. It's enticing to dogs. They love it. Cats enjoy it as well, but cats in general, they're just a little bit more um, refined and they don't necessarily eat everything that they see. And so chocolate's a big one. And while it, depending on the type of chocolate, it can be significantly concerning for toxicity and others, it, it may be not a big deal. So if you think about milk chocolate, I think about chocolates that have more sweet sweetener in them versus the darker chocolates, the less sweet that they are. So the milk chocolate definitely can be a concern if, and let's say, a 20-pound dog got into um, a whole bag of Hershey Kisses. 
But if they were to get into one or two Hershey Kisses, probably not going to be a big issue. Let's replace that with Baker's chocolate or semi-sweet chocolate. And that same amount for that same size of dog might actually be much more problematic where we could have some neurologic changes. So they're agitated or maybe even some body tremors, or maybe they have a heart rate elevation or a high blood pressure, um, some of those things that can happen. And so we don't think a lot. I know that even when I was in practice, I'm like, ah, it's just chocolate. You know, these dogs aren't going to get a big deal, but it really depends on the type of chocolate. And it can be extremely concerning uh, depending on how much they get into. So it can be, it can be fatal then. Certainly. It definitely can be, especially we've had some that had significant heart arrhythmias and blood pressure, heart rate issues, and some neurologic changes, some even body tremors and seizures. Wow. And this was in a dog that a medium sized dog that had gotten into a large amount of Baker's chocolate, which um, that in a hundred percent cacao or a hundred percent pure chocolate, you know, those are the highest amounts. And the, the concerning component is that is called theobromine. That's the active ingredients that's in there that causes that concern. It's similar to caffeine. And so that is depending on, again, the concentration that's in there and the amount. Uh, we, we have seen some fatalities from chocolate and it's so sad because we all think that chocolate's not that big of a deal until it is. Wow. Um, I'm not sure we're going to have a chance to get through all 10 of the, the top 10 uh, tip tones because I want to focus on some specific ones uh, today. So let's just focus on the top three then. So chocolate, thank you for that, because even now I know it's it's dangerous. I did know what could potentially be um, fatal because I used to be in the pharmacy pre-med business. And uh, so I know its mechanism of action and, uh, but I just didn't, it was just good to reinforce, make sure the, I, I bake and cook. So make sure the, the high concentrate stuff is really secure in your pantry and there's no potential. So thank you for that. What are, what are the next two? You got it. So the second one is going to be grapes and raisins. And that's really something that we see again, a lot of access to um, love raisins. When my children were younger, we just made a point that we couldn't have raisins in the house because I knew that they would drop it. We wouldn't see it enough and our dog could get it. Um, now that they're older, it's not as big of an issue, but grapes definitely are larger. So you can kind of see it a little bit more, but that can cause kidney failure to occur in dogs and potentially cats as well. We don't have as big of a, a knowledge as far as yes, for sure, it's an issue in cats or no, it isn't. So we generally treat them precautiously anyways, but in dogs, we definitely know it. We don't have a toxic dose. So that toxic dose means how much can they get into before it's an issue? Uh, the big comment in toxicology is the dose makes the poison, which is very true. Anything can be potentially poisonous depending on how much an animal or a human gets into. And so with grapes and raisins, we don't have that uh, really guide to say they have to get into this much before there's an issue. We have been able to look at our data over the last 20 years to get an idea as to how much a small dog can probably tolerate, how much a large dog can probably tolerate, but kidney failure is the big concern with that. And nothing, um, definitely not one you wanna mess around with because if you wait and see, and the damage to the kidneys have already occurred, um, it's not going to reverse itself. And so it can be fatal to them as well. Yeah, there's only one uh, dialysis machine in this country, or there was as of uh, maybe half a decade ago, a few years back, and that's at UC Davis. And then you can't, uh, you can't treat chronic renal failure in dogs. So, but here's, uh, forgive my ignorance about this topic. It's a very important topic. I know it is, but um yeah, my first question is, is there a large corpus of, of, of research that's, that's, that studied this? Because uh, years ago, when I, when I, when this was a hot topic years ago, I can't re recall why everyone was talking about it in the news, but I just recall they were. Um, uh, at that point in time, it seemed to me that there just was, we, we had some really bad uh, uh, reactions um, uh, to them that somehow we can attribute to. We see some correlations, I guess, uh, to raisins um, and grapes. Um, uh, so is there is there more research now? We're 100% we're sure of this, or is it still one of those things? We don't have a large corpus of research, but it's say, be better safe than sorry sort of thing. Where are we at? Yeah, Question. yeah. 
Yeah, great question. So we know that grapes and raisins will cause kidney failure. We don't know specifically what inside it causes that to happen. There was, I think it's been about a year now, there was a, a paper that was um, published where they they think they found a correlation between tartaric acid, which is in grapes and raisins, and linking that with kidney failure. And they feel that way because they have found that there's some like cream of tartar and some other tartaric acid um, products that have also caused a similar kidney failure to occur. The downside is that we, we don't know. There hasn't been any research to really, to really make sure that we can say, yes, that's exactly what it is. At this point, if it is or it isn't, isn't going to change. We don't know how much tartaric acid is in that particular grape or raisin that was ingested. There's a lot of different varieties that are out there. And I think the goal at some point would be to kind of research it further to be able to say without a doubt that is the toxic component and then potentially find a, a patient side test that could maybe test for that particular component to know how aggressive the care needs to be. We're a long ways out from that for sure. There's always been some talk about actually doing more research, more testing. There aren't a lot of places who are going to allow us to feed dogs uh, grapes and raisins, put them into kidney failure and see what happens. Um, that type of research just isn't kosher <laughs> in this day and age, which is good. I'm glad that it isn't, but it slows down our progress when it comes to that for sure. Then, right, that is a huge problem, and you do, you're, we do not want to do that. Uh, we just had a recent guest with the Beagle Freedom Project talking all about animal testing, and our, my hope is that AI or AGI will be able to solve the need for some of those. They'll be able to look at uh, complex molecules and have a better understanding, um, but just having this conversation alone has convinced me to be much more careful uh, with my fuzzy butts uh, around grapes and raisins because I use both. I love grapes myself. Um, and but the, the good news with my fuzzy butts is if it doesn't have bacon, cheese, or peanut butter in it, they're just not interested. You can give them a, a carrot or a piece of celery or an apple or anything, and like, no, Poppy, that's just not going to happen. Yeah, so, don't don't try to don't try to feed them fruits or vegetables. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, one of the things is you know you don't know what you don't know. So years ago, like twenty probably at least 20 years ago, I had um, a dog named Pete and I had no idea you weren't supposed to feed dogs grapes. And luckily nothing happened to him, but I would give it to him as like a, you know, like a little refreshing treat after we would be outside and he loved them. He thought they were little balls. So he would play with them for a little bit. And then when he bit into it, his eyes would pop open. I mean, it was cute to see him do it. But then somebody was like, oh no, grapes could kill him. And I'm like, oh my God, my dog's going to die. I gave him a grape three months ago. <laughs> yeah. And he was fine. He well, lived yeah. to be 14 years old. So I didn't um, kill my dog, but you know, that's the, that's one of the things. And I may be skipping around Luke, um, but so on your website, you have all these things listed. Is there a way that you reach out to pet parents other than your website? Is there any education or pamphlets that maybe we could hand out to people? We do a lot of walks with Puppy Up. Yeah, so we do have we, we do have a lot of um, social media content. We have newsletters, so you can sign up for to get onto our mailing list. And quarterly, we send out newsletters. And some of the information is more geared towards um, pet parents. And some of the information is more geared towards veterinary professionals. But there is something to learn from, from both sides. And we do have a lot of different brochures that are available. Uh, we generally have, you know, different organizations and veterinary clinics that will reach out and, and will hand out those. You know, they'll have them sitting at their, at their office. If you have a, you know, your veterinary clinic, ask your, ask your office, your clinic staff, if they yeah. have any, any of those um, things available. We have different toxins. We have uh, different toxins. We also have like top toxins, different dangers in your home. Uh, sometimes it's also just general health and well-being um, brochures as well. So there's a lot of those resources available. I would encourage you to go to our website and kind of maneuver around the website. You can find access to a lot of that there. Okay. 
Excellent. Okay, let's get to number three on that list. Yeah, number three. So xylitol. Um, xylitol is, the, is our top three, and it's it's been in the top ten for quite some time. But this last year, it's made it was number three. Xylitol is a sugar alcohol, so it's a sugar substitute, and it may be listed as xylitol, may be listed as birch sugar, uh, birch extract. They're uh, birch alcohol. They're changing the name. They're you know using the name a little bit um, interchangeably for some of those. Xylitol is produced by uh, extracting uh, a, an enzyme or a chemical from birch wood, uh, which is why they a lot of times will call it birch sugar as well. And it can cause a significant drop in blood sugar in dogs, as well as liver failure to occur. So definitely can be fatal to, to dogs. The good news for the cats is that so we have found over time and with a small study that was done, that it doesn't affect cats the way that it does dogs. And so we feel that they're pretty um, free from that. The one neat thing about xylitol is probably, we all have a favorite toxin and the least favorite toxin. And xylitol is probably my favorite toxin only because it has such great human health benefits. And I know there's different foods that do as well, but it has, a, it's a great uh, sugar substitute for diabetics. It um, has a great, um, for obesity, you know, there's just a lot of uses for it. They've been using it for, to potentially help ear infections in children. Uh, they've done studies with it to see if it increases um, gastric motility after surgery for humans. They have um, used it for um, helping to ameliorate uh, signs of diabetes, type two diabetes. And they've had great responses with studies with that in rats. And so it's really kind of one of those where you think, gosh, this is a great product. It also has non-sweetening effects in the sense that it can get used for lotions and skin gels and a wound dressing because it helps to uh, inhibit bacteria from growing. And so it also helps to, it's called a humectant. So it helps to uh, retain moisture. So it helps to preserve shelf life when you think about deodorants that we don't want to dry out or lotions and things like that. So you can find it in a lot of different areas. Um, the big one we think about is, is sweetening, but also that it helps to fight cavities. It's a big, what we call anti-cariogenic. So it has a cavity fighter in humans. And so you'll see it in sugar-free gums uh, because it also helps with the teeth. And you'll see it in special dentistry, toothpaste, mouthwashes, dental floss. We found it in dental floss. And um, so that's that's been our top three of, and certainly been in the top 10 for a while, but top three last year. Wow. Z that's that's unbelievable that xylitol has so many wonderful beneficial ap uh, applications for humans in so many different ways. Didn't know that the lotions, the topical uh, applications had no idea, but it's just so potentially um, deadly to your dogs. Um, what are the before and that goes on to something I want to talk to ne next about comparative toxicology. But before we get into that, what are the top? Um, so that's great. Uh, because I would imagine some dogs, uh, some fuzzy butts lick uh, uh, their pet, their pet parents. And uh, so they have to be very aware of xylitol then uh, and their topical, uh, whether it's lotion or whatever. So what? So that's good to know. But what are the top food items that we really have to, to worry about that are non-diabetic um, out there? There's like gum, I guess like gum and everything. What are the top ones that we need to know? Xylitol is almost always in this. So you got to be, don't leave your gum around. Yeah. That gum, like you said, that's certainly number one. That's going to be the most common uh, exposure that we're going to see with xylitol. Mints. And these, what I what I always I always like to point out is that they may not say they're sugar-free. These gums and mints may not say that they're sugar-free. And so people aren't thinking to, to even look. And some of them may even contain sugar and xylitol. And so um, gums, mints, those are the big ones. Uh, there are, I call them boutique brands, so they're not necessarily the mainstream brands of foods, but some of those specialty items, uh, we've seen it in ice cream, puddings, uh, there's uh, granola bars or energy bars, weight loss bars, any type of a weight loss product. Uh, the last one I saw was a, a keto bar, 
and it contained about um, seven or eight grams of xylitol in, it, in that bar, which is a really large amount. So those are the big ones that I would watch out for. There's a lot of concern about it being in peanut butter because if you're a dog owner and you've never given your pet peanut butter, you're not probably really a dog owner. <laughs> and so, um, that bit, again, that's where we go back to those kind of boutique brands and there's a better name for them, I'm sure, but that's how I describe them. The mainstream kind of Jeff Skippy so far, the store brands, we haven't seen xylitol in those products, mm -hmm. but um, it has been in some of those, some of those other more specialty type um, peanut butters. So we got to be really careful with that. That's one that's, um, there's even actually legislation that's been brought about to try to require xylitol or xylitol warning be on labels of certain products. The downside is that it doesn't encompass every product. Uh, if I could skip away from food for a second, any chewable vitamin, chewable vitamin, gummy, uh, liquid medication, any type of over-the-counter supplement, anything that has flavor to it that you need to kind of chew and taste before you swallow it, um, those can have xylitol in them as well. Wow, that's a lot of good information. Um, it, and that dovetails, I think, very uh, well into the, the, the concept of comparative to toxicology, toxicology, because here on our show, we talk a lot about um, comparative oncology, because I'm not sure how much you know about the Puppy Up Foundation, but that's kind of our focus on how dogs are a model for cancer in people and that they get cancer uh, organically, um, spontaneously. And so they're, you know, we don't need to do uh, give, induce cancer in them to be able to study cancer in dogs. So uh, talk to us about comparative toxicology. Is it a, a new field and, and, uh, and how good are dogs a model for um, toxicology in people? Yeah, so in most clinical trials for FDA approved products, dogs are included in um, the preclinical uh, trials. So in their toxicological studies that are done, uh, they're often done in mice, rats, and in dogs are then a common, a common species. Uh, there are some, um, some different, um, maybe, um, uh, maybe it's a monkey type, you know, species too, but dogs are often in there. And I think that they, you know, as far as comparative toxicology goes, I think it's kind of been an ongoing, it's been around for, for decades, but um, perhaps not termed in that, in that manner. We kind of talk a lot about One Health um, when we're in veterinary medicine and One Health is a lot of like what you're talking about with comparative medicine, how, um, how one particular disease or toxin kind of, you know, um, affects different species in the same manner. And what's really interesting in toxicology, and we can go back to xylitol as that example, um, dogs for some reason are extremely sensitive and it affects them differently. It affects them because xylitol causes an insulin surge, which causes the glucose to drop. In humans, it doesn't. It doesn't cause an insulin surge to happen at all. And they don't know if it's because it's absorbed differently or a, a different time frame. So there are definitely some things that we can use comparative toxicology with. A lot of the medications, uh, when we think about heart medications, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, a lot of those things, side effects are going to be pretty similar um, between the species. But then you always get that little red herring that just doesn't, if they didn't read the book, why aren't you comparing, you know, why can't we use this together? Yeah, that that's the One Health. That's wonderful because we also talk about One Cancer, um, which falls underneath One Health, um, because we know now, and I guess I think we always should have known, and I, I'm not really sure how long it took us to get it to this point, but we should have always known that 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 we know that dogs are biologically comparable to us um, and genetically and so on and so forth. But the more important thing is so we, we share that, but we also share an ecosystem. Um, so, uh, it's important for us to take that macro shared species sort of look, um, at things that we ingest and things that we, we experience environmentally. And that's a wonderful segue into the, the, the number one topic I wanted to talk to you about, which is getting a lot of press these days, and that's organ organophosphate poisonings. So you've done some research in, in that area. We're excited to talk about it. So please tell us about what's going on with that, what we need to worry, worry about that as well. Yeah, so organophosphates can uh, really range between a 
mildly toxic to severely toxic. I like to throw carbamates into that class as well because organophosphates and carbamates, they have, they're very similar in signs and very similar mechanisms. So what happens is there's um, acetylcholine, which kind of helps, I don't know, for lack of a better term, kind of move our muscles, move our body. Um, and then there's little um, receptors and then there's enzymes that come through that block that. So when our muscles and our nerves get stimulated, they don't constantly get um, continuous stimulation. And what organophosphates and carbamates do is they block that, that enzyme to stop, so that stops that stimulation from occurring. And so they're continually getting um, stimulated, these different receptors are. And they can cause what we term as sludge signs or SLUD signs. It's just an acronym for salivation, lacrimation, uh, urination, which means they're, they're kind of dribbling constantly urinating, diarrhea, um, or they're defecating frequently. And then the GE at the end of sludge is for gastro, um, gastrointestinal. And so that would be like vomiting and any other GI signs. And that's because of overstimulation of these particular receptors. And animals can truly drown in their um, saliva, in their secretions that are developing because it's so significant. And it can happen with the organophosphates or the carbamates. And one that I think about is uh, methamyl. And that's in some of the, it's an insecticide that's in like a fly bait. And it's something that you see probably more frequently in the rural settings because it's sold in like a 10 pound or a 40 pound bucket. And it's a granule and has a, for me, before I was really in this, uh, in this role, I thought, gosh, low concentration things, not going to be a big issue, even no matter what it is. And these are, this is a 1% methamyl, which is a carbonate. And just a, a tiny amount, a, a tiny mouthful, a tiny bite can be enough to, to be fatal to these guys because they end up having their, their CNS becomes overstimulated. So they have body tremors and they're seizuring. Um, again, they have a lot of that, uh, that salivation, those saliva that's being, that's being produced. And um, they, can, they can either drown in their, own, in their own secretions that are being developed, or they can have even... Um, they can have respiratory depression and even respiratory arrest um, from that. And, and then just the tremors and seizures, just a really, a, a really potentially fatal issue. A lot of times that's in the news on the human side because of their concern with some of the organophosphates that's being used in a few of the flea and tick collars for dogs. And that is one that is of a, a lower toxicity risk, at least for dogs and the concentration is extremely low. And so we don't typically see that as big of an issue, but I know that there is definitely concern on the human side because of the potential for um, humans to be exposed from the residue on the collars. Yeah, isn't, isn't there a link or we have a pretty good idea there's a correlation between um, um, cancer and organophosphates, is that correct? Is that accurate? I think there is on a long-term kind of chronic basis the the good side is for us on the human, on the animal side is that we don't typically see a lot of those long-term carcinogen issues uh, because one, they're either not exposed to it at a, at a long enough time period or frequent enough basis or high enough dosing, but and definitely any of those types of insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, that are being used on the human side there they seems to be every year more and more research is done where they're finding links to um to specific carcinogens i like that ac acronym uh sludge signs can you repeat what sludge uh, stands for again yeah so salivation lacrimation so that's tearing um urination they're just urinating frequently or a larger amounts and then defecation or diarrhea, and then GI for the GE for gastrointestinal or um, gastroenteritis. So vomiting is usually um, in that as well. Um, wow, uh, things to be very, very aware of because that just sounds horrifying, uh, the symptoms that you listed and uh, that frightens me. Um, let's get to another topic that's also another hot topic now, um, and one I'm a bit familiar with. We've had 
um, some consultants come on and talk about cannabis use and our canine fuzzy butts. I think mostly we're talking about ca uh, cannabis use and, and canines, not felines. Um, but uh, in the news, uh, I, you know, at least once a month or so, I'm always seeing uh, an article about a dog potentially overdosing because it ate flour. So there, and I know that's not accurate because flour is not um, activated. So there's a lot of myths, a lot of misunderstandings. So please talk us through, and I know cannabis use is on the rise these days. So please uh, educate our audience about cannabis poisoning. Yeah. So with cannabis, we're thinking about um, marijuana, the um, you know the the smokable um, marijuana itself, as well as um, THC products. So now with uh, marijuana being legalized in so many different states either for medicinal use or for recreational use, there are a lot of products that we call edibles that contain um, THC in them. So they may be um, chocolate uh, containing, they may be cooked products, candies, you name it, can have THC in there. Or they could also be like a cannabis oil or a THC oil. And then there's like the hash, the, the remnant from smoking that kind of traditional joint um, as well. And what we can see with dogs and cats alike, again, cats are a little bit more refined and don't tend to get into as many things as the dogs do, but um, they have different uh, metabolites. So when that THC is being broken down, it gets broken down into different chemical or products called metabolites. And it's different than it is in humans. There are some that are similar, but then there's a lot of other ones in animals as well. And dogs tend to be more sensitive than humans may. And there isn't, we know what a what we call an LD50 is or potentially fatal dose for marijuana is or THC, but we don't really have a solid, this number is gonna cause an issue, this number isn't going to cause an issue because there's a lot of individual variability and sensitivity with dogs and cats with that. And so a lot of times one small edible that a human might ingest, let's say a, a small quarter of a chocolate edible, uh, wouldn't have significant effects on them and may could really, you know, flatten a dog out for a while. So they usually become extremely sedated. Um, they a lot of times have difficulty walking. They can have low uh, heart rate and low blood, uh, blood pressure. They can potentially have low uh, body temperature as well. These are guys that I usually, in most cases, like to have monitored in a clinic now because as astute as a pet owner may be, they're not able to measure and monitor blood pressure and they can check heart rate, but um, that doesn't necessarily correlate if we don't have that blood pressure to go with. So I usually like to have them get some supportive care in the clinic. Most of the time, these aren't fatal, but we have had a few dogs where they have been even 24 hours out or 36 hours out, which usually they should be recovered by that time, have still been really significantly affected. And what we have found even with CBD, I think CBD is something to be almost as concerned about. So CBD itself has the THC or psychoactive component removed. However, there isn't a lot of strong regulation in this, this cannabis world. And so what um, a lot of independent companies have done different studies to test the purity of products. And a lot of them are coming back with THC being in these CBD only type products. And so I always encourage pet parents to avoid either one of those or any type of those, um, if at all possible. I know that there's some animal products that are coming out and they're talking about using them. And those I would say are likely much more reputable companies and most likely, you know, avoiding that THC component. Nobody wants to treat their dog and have them be um, high all the time. Yeah, well, it's an inexact science. I know that because it's all about heat activates the cannabinoids and there's a full spectrum of cannabinoids and they heat at different temperatures, THCA, THC delta, then CBD and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So even so cbd is going to have some resi residual or remnant uh, thc components in it that's for sure um but but you're right in that we're starting to see and i think it's a good thing uh more cbd products that are out there from reputable companies uh to help help with pain management but uh the conversations i'm having and i think that's equally important is to look at thc 
also for a type of pain management for dogs, because again, we deal with dogs in cancer and there are just some dogs that don't take to pain meds or you cannot uh, you cannot obtain their respiratory process or so on and so forth. They just can't get um, adequate pain management, um, which is difficult enough as it is to manage in dogs, I'm sure as you know. Um, so I, I do think that THC has a relevant uh, place in pain management in, in fuzzy butts, maybe not felines, but certainly our canine counterparts. Um, but the question that I have that nobody seems to know about um, is dosing. And for that reason, I've talked, tried to talk to so many vets about this very same topic, but for liability issues and maybe potentially state licensing issues, they just can't talk about it at all. So we need to find out more data. We need to have more data about dosing and dosing levels of CBD and THC in dogs. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, for sure. And I think one of the problems or one of the drawbacks or hindrances with that is because a lot of times um, when these products aren't quote pure, uh, we can potentially get a dosing from a pet owner when they call and say, my dog got into this and this is what it is. And we calculate it. However, if we were to have it analyzed, we may actually get a different concentration or a different strength. And so I think that's where some of the, the, um, the issue runs into play too. If you tell me that your dog got into 200 milligrams of ibuprofen at one tablet, then they got into 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. If you tell me that your dog got into 20 milligrams of CBD with five milligrams of THC, uh, we just don't have that comfort level to have that safety level to say, yes, that's what it is. And so finding that specific toxic dose is often very difficult when, especially before, um, before it was, it was licensed or, or legalized when people were making it up as they go along, they were getting THC butter and they were making up their own things and they were using it. And so it wasn't a matter of how much did they get into? It was just, they got into it. So we don't really, you know, we can't really make um, toxic doses based on that. Yeah, and there are more products out there that are using the activated THC, which that's the difference. And I, I wanted to discern that difference for the audience is that you hear about dogs getting in the flower. Well, that that's not activated yet. So that that may have some type of side effects, but it's not going to have the THC is just not activated. So it's not going to do anything. Dog well, gummies and, and food like products that contain CBD and THC that has the activated uh, component. So that's because you don't need to heat it up to be able to activate it. You just consume it. So for pet parents that are consumers of cannabis, you know, you want to you want to secure your flower, but most importantly, you want to have your gummies, you know, far away from your your fuzzy butts as possible. That's the message that I wanted to get out there. It's a good message, wouldn't you say? Yeah, you bet. Okay, let's move on to we got so so much ground to cover, and I'm getting a little nervous looking at the clock. I was gonna say your your list isn't getting very very short. Well, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Please, please be patient. Um, let's let's do real quickly. What are the top uh, poisonous uh, plants, and then we can get to some other ones. What are the top ones that that you? Uh, yeah, so top about? calls lilies, and when we talk about lilies, what we're talking about is the renal toxic or the kidney toxic lilies. So these are lilies that are in the lilium genus or the hemerocallus genus. So your day lilies, Asiatic lilies, oriental lilies, tiger lilies, Easter lilies, those things that we think about in a fresh cut bouquet, um, a lot of those, those large ones, those are gonna be in that lilium um, genus very commonly. And that is a concerning cats. We can see kidney failure developing with that. And every part of that plant is toxic. So the stem, the leaves, the petals, the uh, pollen, you know, when that cats, they come home and they're, they're full of bright, they've got bright yellow face and chest. Um, they've been licking themselves and trying to groom that off. Even that um, has the component. We don't know specifically what the toxic component is, but they've been able to say that it's correlated throughout the plant. Even the water that the cut flowers are in that vase, because it's what we call a water soluble toxin, uh, can potentially have that in there too. So definitely the most common call that we get and probably the most, the, the most common out there, you know, commonly available uh, plant. The other one would be sago palm. So sago palm, we used to kind of limit it to the warm uh, areas of the, of the country. And they have, um, fortunately, as they do with everything else, they've made hybrids. And so they've made little dwarf sago palms that you can have in your house. 
And so we see sago palm poisoning in Alaska as well as in Florida. And so it isn't really limited to the warmer climates anymore. Definitely the seeds are the most toxic part of it, which is more of a concern with a larger plant that's outside. However, any portion of it, the fronds, the, the, um, the bark, all parts of that are toxic. And that can cause significant stomach signs. So vomiting, blood, um, diarrhea with blood, um, significant abdominal pain, but then also liver failure. And um, in some, in some um, cases, we can see some neurologic signs of body tremors and seizures as well. Um, going back to Lily's real quick. So that just sounds horrible. And Lily's can be fatal, correct? And Definitely. Yeah. The kidney doesn't regenerate itself. Um, like the, you know, the liver, we have a chance when the liver fails to have some regeneration and recovery. But depending on the degree of damage to the kidney, once it's there, it's there. And so sometimes these cats can be, can live with chronic kidney disease and be managed. And sometimes their disease or their damage is too significant and they're not able to be managed that way either. And so that means they can also get, they can also get into trouble if they drink water from the flower plot of a lily, correct? Correct. So yes, then that correct. should be the rule of thumb for all pet parents um, that have fuzzy butts, no lilies at all in the house because the pollen, wow. I didn't know about that at all. So it's just a dangerous flower to have in your house. Yeah. Um, real quick. A, if if I could say real quick, we have a campaign. It's called No Lilies for Kitties. You can get online, noliliesforkitties.com. And it's a great resource that shows you different pictures and types of that particular lily that we're concerned with. And also good alternatives because there's a lot of lilies or plants that have lily in the name but they're not in those two genuses. And so they can cause different issues. Like a Peruvian lily is a good one. Peruvian lily is often in a lot of those fresh cut bouquets too. It's, it's inexpensive, it's, it lives for a long time, but it's not the same concern, it's just a stomach upset. So you gotta really look for those that are in that lilium genus or the hemerocallus. Um, and the Easter lily is also in that group, and that's what was something yeah. we're going to see um, so often. But it fascinates me that the the toxin, the poison, suffuses so many things and so many aspects, and it brings to mind real quickly uh, some a plant that I grew up with that could, that I, from my understanding, is as as equally lethal, and that's the oleander because even in the ground around it you can find the toxins in there. So do you see a lot of oleander poisonings or is that just in the South? Yeah, surprisingly, it's really just in the South. It actually, uh, the state of Arizona is where we get the most oleander calls. So they must be an oleander loving state. And that one contains, oleander contains um, what we call cardiac toxins. So toxins that are gonna be uh, problematic with the heart. So they'll cause heart rate, uh, blood pressure, rhythm issues. It can definitely be potentially fatal. We have found that if um, if an animal gets into oleander, if it's just a, a small, like a nibble, small nibble, they often uh, don't have significant issues, but we still usually have them monitored in a clinic just to make sure so they can watch their heart rhythm and their heart rate and blood pressure. And um, it's, I'm trying to think, I had, it's been quite a while before I, since I've seen a, a significantly affected animal with oleander. Um, that's something else. Let's get to quickly the next item on the list, which is very important, environmental toxins. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, briefly like herbicides. So let's talk about what are the top ones for pet parents to be worried about? Yeah. So, um, it's a good question. I would say that when we think about residential herbicides, fertilizers, most of those are just going to be stomach upset if they are exposed to it. If they were to chew the bottle and ingest a large amount of it, we may see some neurologic signs from them. But those, um, we probably think more of the insecticides that contain permethrin type products. Uh, permethrin is a really low margin of safety in cats, there's a higher margin of safety in dogs. Uh, bifenthrin, bifenthrin in dogs, again, we kind of flip flop things. We expect bifenthrin, which is a pyrethroid and should be a pretty wide margin of safety in dogs. However, it is not, and it can cause a lot of body tremors, um, stomach upset, potentially seizures for them as well. And that is something that you can find more commonly in your fire ant products. So a lot of fire ant granules, 
someone will go, they'll put um, fire ant, you know, these granules on the, the fire ant mounds and they won't think anything of it. And the dog will go out and ingest a small amount. Everyone will go to bed and then they wake up in the morning and the dog's um, having some significant tremors. Fertilizers themselves for residential is usually not a big issue. Most of the time it's just stomach upset, especially if it's been applied onto the yard, it's been watered in. Even if it hasn't been watered in and it's a, and it's a granule product, the dog, I always say, you know, they really have to be a vacuum cleaner to get enough to really go in there and, and, and be of a concern. The, the one thing that I think is most concerning really out of anything is the rodenticides. And I know that they're in the house a lot, but they're also out in the environment. People will place them out in their garages or around the house. Maybe they don't put them in the bait station as they should, or you know, these are they're not they're not pet proof. They're just to, to help deter pets from getting into them. But those are probably even more problematic. And uh, mole and gopher baits. So mole and gopher baits, those are ones that have a really pretty narrow margin of safety. It's not uncommon probably for us to get calls where the owner has dug the hole, they buried the mole and gopher bait under the ground, and then the dog later in the day, the next day, smelled it, saw that, saw that the ground was disturbed, and decided to dig and find out what it was. Um, what about, what about uh, when you have the pest controller come out and spray your house? Is that so? How confident are we that that, whatever they use, um, that that stuff is safe for our fuzzy butts? Yeah. Most of the time, it's not going to be an issue. So generally, the components that are in there, the active ingredients that are in there, are an extremely low concentration, and they're of a type that uh, fipronel is a good example. A lot of these might contain fipronel and a very low concentration. We found that it has a very wide margin of safety in pets. And even some of the others that can contain other type of um, of pyrethroid type products are low, low concentrations like a 0.1% or 0.5%. And those generally to, to speak, if a pest control officer came to my house, I wouldn't hesitate to, and sprayed, I wouldn't hesitate to have my pet um, around it. Now I would get them out of the house when it was happening, just because the fumes can be irritating and maybe they may have some respiratory, some coughing or respiratory irritation. Um, but once it's dried, if you follow the, if you follow the timing as far as how long a human should be out of it and keep that for the pet, then that's okay. Once it's dried, if there's any residue that's there and the animal goes and licks the floorboard, uh, they're licking the baseboard because they can smell it and that so they want to taste it. Just going to be really stomach upset that develops in those guys. One, um, I, I was having my yard treated years ago and um, for some reason, this company thought that it would be okay to go in the backyard with my dog and spray it. And I, quit using that company. But when I talked to them, they're like, oh, it's not going to hurt your dog. I said, well, okay, the next time you come and spray, I want you to do it barefooted. And then I want you to pick up your foot and look it and then tell me what, if you're going to have an issue. I said, as soon as you're ready to do that, you can come back. I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't hear from that. Uh, the guy that was, that sprayed the yard. I'd never heard from him again. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, definitely, yeah, definitely any of those can cause some skin irritation for sure. But when we think about, is this going to be fatal? Is this going to cause systemic, what we say, or organ damage? Um, most of them are, not, especially if they're being used as labeled, um, they shouldn't really be an issue. Do we have, though, uh, Dr. Schmidt, do we have a, a large enough body of, of data out there to say long, to, to understand long-term exposure? and the risk associated with long-term exposure? Probably not, to be okay. honest, probably not. Because one, you know, when we have our, our pets, you know, they, they're not living decades and decades as they are in humans. And a lot of times they're not correlating, you know, that, that, that cancer that has developed or that other disease that has developed. Well, I, you know, I, I spray my house every three months or something like that. And so I, I don't think that we have that uh, really information available to be able to say that. And it's, uh, we, we talk about it in the sense of how do we know chronic long-term and, and sometimes that chronic long-term for us is 
if they've been exposed to it for 30 days or for 90 days or, you know, but that um, how that affects them and that follow up 10 years, 15 years down the road. I'm not aware of there may be someone out there, a university out there that's looking at that. I'm not aware of what of, of who they are at this time. Yeah, at least as it pertains to cancer research, we don't really do a good job of lo looking at uh, risk factors and prevention. Uh, we look at treatments. Most of the money goes towards treatments. Um, all right, so we've talked about a lot of the toxins. I know we left some off the list, but in the interest of time, and I think that's equally important for us to get to, is let's talk about poison therapy and, and intervention. And I want to prelude this or preface this with a story that was recent that I I alluded to at the beginning of the show. And uh, recently, Ginger went out of town on business and puppy up business. And so she left me to take, take care of her of her fuzzy butts. And 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 she left uh, some medicine out in a Ziploc bag on one of the shelves. And unbeknownst to me, um, it was clearly labeled, but somehow it went from the shelf down into one of her kids, Kelly, her young kid. And so when I saw it, I saw the, the torn up plastic bag and uh, that it had uh, another dog's meds in there, but I had no idea what the med was. So I had that just, first off, I have like, when that happens, I have like five heart attacks. That's that's the way I respond. I'm really bad in the near term, immediate crisis situation, but give me a couple of seconds and I'll, I'll have a laser-like focus on, on how to address it. So I was able to contact Ginger, uh, she was in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, be able to talk to her. And she was able to, we were able to figure out what it was and it had the potential for being fatal. Anyways, I tried to pass the baton to Ginger and uh, and she failed miserably. And for her part, she was in Madison, Wisconsin and she was and in I was in a, hold, hold on a second. And I was in a storage unit, a metal storage unit surrounded by other metal storage units. So um, internet connection was not good. I knew we were going to get a whole litany, litany of excuses, but what, whatever the case, I, there is a bigger story here and a bigger point here uh, is that uh, what I know is that time is of time is of the essence, and you have to answer a very uh, a, a important number of questions to understand what your next steps are going to be. Um, and uh, and so I picked up the ball and was able to contact uh, a veterinarian and do a, a little research and and determine that there was no immediate acute risk uh, to Kelly. Um, and thank God she, uh, she she came out okay, and it could have turned out badly. So what I want to start this off with, uh, uh, Dr. Schmidt, is is there are a ton of pet parents out there like like me um, that they're in that crisis moment and they freak out and they don't know what to do. So walk us through that whole process. The when it, once it happens, what they should do, the steps they should take, um, and then talk about therapy. And, and whatever, let's just talk about that subject. Yeah, you bet. So number one, easier said than done, don't panic. Uh, but we, we've all been in that situation. Uh, they got into, our pet got into something that they shouldn't have, or we feel that they shouldn't have, and we don't know what to do. Um, try, to, try, to, try to take a deep breath, try to relax, because uh, we as veterinary professionals need you as pet parents or pet caregivers to be able to think somewhat rationally. And the reason for that is because the less information you give us, the more treatment we're going to end up recommending for the pet because we don't know what we're trying to cover. Uh, for those medications um, examples, the, this is this is a, a widely called in um, issue. The bag, the dog got into the baggie of medications. I don't remember what it was, or I was pet sitting, or you know something like that. So what I always recommend is either taking a picture of the pet's medication, the bottle, the label so that you know what it is, how many were in that bottle to begin with, what the milligram strength is, or write it down. We don't write anything down anymore. We take pictures of everything. So either way is fine, and, but so that you have that. Because if the pet gets into that bottle and they chew it up, a lot of times you can't read the label anymore. When this happens at 11 o'clock at night and your general practitioner veterinarian is fast asleep, you cannot get a hold of them to know how much uh, carprofen was in that bottle or that milligram strength. Uh, your human pharmacy is probably not open at that time either. So when they get into your medication, um, they it's, it's difficult to know how much that is. So I always um, encourage people to, to write that information down or have a picture of it so that if the pet does get into it, they know what to do. Um, when that pet, um, you come home and that medication bottle has tablets or capsules strewn all over the floor, 
Take that time to count them and find out what it is. Don't call your veterinarian and say, I have no idea because we do have an idea. And if we don't have an idea, again, we're going to have to make more recommendations. And so if we can, we can pull that information together and say, okay, it was a bottle of 60. I've just picked up 45 of them off of the floor. I've been taking it for one week. We can start to figure out, put puzzle pieces together to find out what that um, potential amount is they got into and that risk is. If you're gonna use baits around your house, um, any type of rodenticide bait, a green block of bait is not a green block of bait. Um, they have all have different ingredients in them. They can cause different illnesses and signs to develop. Different amounts can be ingested before they cause an issue. So same thing, write it down, take a picture of it, save your receipt, um, anything like that so that um, we can kind of help determine what it is that they got into as opposed to just a colored block of bait. So the lesson there is uh, keep a database of your poisons and have as much data ready to go um, for uh, the, the, the expert, the veterinarian that you're speaking with. Um, to Ginger's tremendous credit, she is very meticulous in labeling everything and, and securing everything in the most part. It was just a freak situation. And so we had that data that I was able to communicate with the veterinarians, and that's how we were able to feel that there was not the next step that needed to take and unnecessary to take unnecessary set steps. Um, so I uh, don't want everyone to feel I was dissing on Ginger because they're going to send me the hate. <laughs> The hate mail. Yeah. Why? Yeah. You know, Ginger is human and everybody, you know, it's very frequent. It's common. People do it. They do it with their pets medication. They do it with their human medication. I do it when I go on, a, when I, when I travel, I don't want to take my bottles of vitamins or whatever with me. I, I throw it in a baggie. I I'm not real sure the how the baggie got off of the shelf three layers above and in a box, but we're, I have no idea. How probably, that I will say wouldn't. this. I will say this, that one time years and years ago, I came home and one of my dogs, love her to death. Um, there, there she is. She opened a cabinet and got the Tylenol out. And I found Tylenol all on the floor. Of course, and there were three other dogs in the kitchen with her. I was told to induce vomiting on all of them. That was a wonderful evening. That's all I have to say about that. It was that, disgusting. That was exactly yeah. where I was going with 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 my point is is that once you have that that data, well, in my case, um, the, the big question was, um, it was most of us all know is hydrogen peroxide. Um, so at what point in that decision tree process, um, while you're getting the data, compiling the data, do you just say, hey? prophylactically, let's just go ahead um, and give them a cap full of hydrogen peroxide. And then the second question, follow-up question is, what's that time window that we have to operate? Yeah. So number one, never give hydrogen peroxide to a cat. Um, it can uh, definitely be fatal to them. They don't wow. tolerate it well. They're extremely sensitive with their stomach. And they, in order to get an animal to vomit with hydrogen peroxide, it's, a, it's what we call a gastric irritant. So it's gonna irritate um, the, the wall of the stomach lining. And so cats do not tolerate that well and um, never, um, no, not even a small amount um, would do that in a cat. For a dog, um, honestly, I, I say, let's not induce vomiting unless we know we need to induce vomiting. And so we, you know, we typically, for most things, we have a window. What is that specifically? If it's a liquid or a chewable medication or a quick dissolve, we only have really kind of a few minutes. And so once we've passed that time, and most of the time we have already passed that time, uh, we, we just need to wait and wait until we gather a little bit more information. Uh, for other tablets, capsules, a lot of times we'll have an hour or two where we can hopefully still induce vomiting and get something back. The downside to just going ahead and kind of what you said, you know, mentioned prophylactically inducing vomiting is that it's not a what we call a benign process. It's not a risk free process. Uh, definitely animals can have aspiration with that, depending on the type of product they got into most chemicals. We definitely don't want them to vomit that back up. Because if it's a concern where it can cause damage to the stomach or the intestinal tract, 
that's including the esophagus. The esophagus is very difficult to treat and manage if it becomes damaged. And so we don't want that coming back up a second time, but we can have a lot better effects um, results with managing, allowing that to pass through the intestinal tract. And so there's a lot of things we don't ever want to induce vomiting with. And so I always encourage people don't, one, don't, don't go rogue, don't go doing it on your own, get a veterinary professional involved uh, because they can also help you with the amount of hydrogen peroxide. If um, there's never a, there's never a time when it's okay to keep giving it until they vomit. And so uh, we always want to, we always want to work in a very small confined amount and so getting a veterinary professional involved is going to be really helpful for avoiding any negative situation from occurring. That's just step one. Well, in my case, that was the, the that issue was raised, you know, about yeah. inducing vomit, vomiting. And I was like, I don't know how long it's been since she ingested it. And I don't want to do it without knowing, without having that information. And I don't want to do it prophylactically until we know we know more what were the potential. And so it was a good call on, on my end, but that's great. I didn't know that it can do so much damage. And in some cases, some poisons, you don't want to induce vomiting well and as well. And I sure did, surely didn't know that, that with cats, it could be really, really bad. Didn't know that. So that's all great data um, and information for our audience. So what can pet parents do to prevent, other than the things that we mentioned before, what are the top things that pet parents can do to prevent the poisoning process from even happening in the first place? Yeah, so I always recommend toddler proofing your house. So go back if you've um, if you if you've had children and they're long gone, or maybe you never have, but you've got some friends. Surely there are some times in in a, in someone that you know in, in their circle's life with it have it has a, a young child, and if a toddler can get into it, your pet can get into it. And and um, if you have a if you have a cat that um, would like to be the only pet in the house. Uh, you got to go a little bit more because they'll knock things off of the table or the counter for the dog to get um, in that in that goal of being the sole pet in the house. Um, but I say keep your medications behind closed doors. Keep the, you know, like your pantry, keep those xylitol containing products, gum. If you have a, a car cup of gum, uh, please do not leave your pet in there just to run in and run a quick errand because um, they well, we get a lot of calls where that situation has happened. I was gone for five minutes. I left my dog in the car. They destroyed the car cup of, of xylitol containing gum, and now they're they're having issues. Um, for our products like you know rodenticides, if you're needing to use those types of products or some type of insecticide, make sure that it's in the station that it's that it's supplied in. Um, keep that in an area where you uh, get, have it tucked away as far as you can from an animal getting into it. These guys, they they love, you know, they live by their nose, they live by their mouth. And so they're going to smell it out. They're going to try to, they, they want to find out what it is. And they're going to do that by tasting it and, and chewing on it. Um, any type of products outside. So if you have your fertilizers or um, motor oil, brake fluids, any of those things, keep them up and out of reach of the animal behind a closed door would be most ideal. Uh, some animals certainly can open up those, those uh, cabinets. I used to always keep all my cleaning products under the sink. I don't know who did not but I didn't know a person growing up that um, I would go to their house and the cleaning products were always under the kitchen sink. And it wasn't until I had children of my own and I thought, gosh, this is a terrible idea. Why are we doing that? And, you know, you put them up higher and you think about it for the pets too. having access to that, especially if it's a door that they could potentially open um, our dishwasher soap, you know, it has, it has sense to it. It has, it's, it's going to make animals want to come to that and taste it and see what it is. Yeah, I have to go back to the cat knocking the stuff off the counter. I think that, that that that's a deliberate thing, not by accident. They say, oh, hey, the dog's down there. Here's a tin of it. Yeah, it yeah. It yeah. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I'm not a cat guy. I have a healthy respect for him. <laughs> All right. That is just a tremendous amount of data that we've uh, taken in this episode. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, you've been wonderful. Is there anything that, that, that I've left out, we've left out on this list that you want to go over or a final message for the, our audience? I think the final message is just always, again, don't panic. There's always some time to figure it out. Get a veterinary professional involved. Don't try to, don't try to figure it out on your own. Um, don't try to treat them on your own. Animals are not small humans, and there's just a lot of, of variations. And so 
take that take that time to contact your veterinarian or an animal poison control center, someone there's always people around who can help you and make sure that you stay on the right path. We get calls where um, people did start doing treatments on their own and their, their treatments caused more damage than what the animal got exposed to. So I just encourage you to, to work with a veterinary professional before you decide to, to um, I say self-medicate, but it isn't self-medicating, but to, to treat on your own with your pets. Yeah, I, let's just go ahead and put it on tape that that's the very first step you should do uh, once you just make sure your dog is okay and secure your your, your kid is, is to call um, the, the pet poison helpline or the SPC, but you know, that's just call someone and, and even before calling your GP, your local GP, because again, they're not the expert, they don't have the information. So that's just the first step. Number one, aside from don't panic, which I do, that's just my instinct is to freak we out. All do. Yeah. We all do. Yes. It's terror. It, it absolutely is terrifying. We've all been in, in the situation uh, probably more times than we care to care to have. And so you provided us with a lot of information to both prevent them and once we get in a situation, know how to handle it. So, Dr. Renee Smith, thank you very much for your time today. Give the audience one more time uh, the contact information for the Pet Poison uh, Helpline uh, on social media as well. Yeah, you bet. So you can find us on our website at PetPoisonHelpline.com. Uh, you can call us at 1-800-213-6680. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn as well. You can just search for Pet Poison Helpline. And give us that Lily uh, website again, please. The Lily Kitties thing. Yeah, you bet. No Lilies for Kitties. That's wonderful. Com. That's wonderful. Uh, Ginger, uh, we're at that time of the show. Did I miss anything? Did I screw anything up on my end? You did not. Of course I didn't. Well. <laughs> pretty much not let's just put it that way um okay before we uh, before we go uh do you have does the puppy up foundation have a cancer uh, tip of the week for our fuzzy butts i do and oh, wow. it's about appetite loss so you know most dogs and and cats they're always hungry so you know pay attention to if they haven't been eating for the last couple of days you might want to take your dog to the vet there could be um, something wrong with their stomach, their colon, all kinds of things that may cause them not to eat. And um, for my own tip is even if your dog eats like it's a lot of amount for the day, if it's eating at a different time of the day or eating just kind of grazing, I typically don't let my dogs graze, but I have one that she was wasn't eating a lot so I, at the time at a time. So I would let her I would leave her food out for her. And um, once I did take her to the vet, she did have a tumor in her stomach. So, and really it was only because she wasn't eating at the right time of the day and the amount for that time of the day that yes, I so, took her in. So change of behavior, we like to speak of it in terms of that. Right, like eating change of pattern. behavior, yeah, with Absolutely. Her Wonderful, wonderful tip. Uh, Ginger, thank, thank you and the Puppy Up Foundation. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, sincerely uh, Dr. Renee uh, Schmidt. She's uh, with the Pet, uh, the pet Poison Hot Helpline. My apologies. Uh, you have the information. Thank you so much, Dr. Schmidt, for being a part of Fuzzy Butts and Friends today. You bet. Thank you for having me. This was fun. You are always welcome back here on our show. You're a tremendous friend of the Fuzzy Butts. If you have more data, new data, anything that you would like to share with us, anything, any new program that the Pet Poison Helpline is launching, you are always welcome to come back here on Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Great. Thank you. All right, everybody. That makes it uh, the finish of this episode this week. Uh, we like to drop our podcast every Tuesday, um, usually around midnight, sometimes a little bit later in the morning. Uh, but you can find it at, uh, we have a YouTube channel that's the fuzz, that's fuzzybuttstudios.com. And you can also find us uh, on your podcast platform, such as iHeartRadio and Spotify. Until next week, everyone, puppy up. Talk soon.